Again, good morning to each of you. It's good to see everyone here. And certainly I have appreciated the kind things that you've said, the prayers that you have offered, and this opportunity to be with you this morning as we worship our great and awesome God. I appreciate the singing uh, this morning. And I'll tell you what, those are some things that uh, we overlook a lot of times, but they are important to the worship. God gives us the opportunity to sing praises to his great name, to encourage each other. And that's how, a lot, that's how we reach a lot of people sometimes is through the singing and the words that are conveyed in that singing. And therefore, our hearts are engaged. And no wonder God encourages us uh, and commands us and directs us to sing uh, without the instrument of music. But our hearts is that instrument that we use. And when we put it in, uh, into the singing, uh, just, it just is it's beautiful. It's encouraging. And I tell you what, it, uh, it'll cause a guy like me to preach himself to death. But I know we're limited on time, so I'll do my best to uh, keep things accordingly. But again, I look forward to our studies this week and hope that uh, you will be encouraged by them. I want to express my appreciation to the elders uh, for their decision to have me come and uh, deliver these lessons uh, that shows gr the confidence they have in me. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate God uh, for men who serve as elders in the local groups uh, because it is an important work. And you can see the wisdom of God by having men do so. And certainly, uh, again, I just appreciate all of you, uh, again, and the kind things that you have said. Acts chapter 17, if you have your Bibles, and let's turn there and look at, again, a few passages that are expressed uh, in these uh, verses. Now, we, have meant, we had mentioned these verses in our uh, Bible class, but I want to point some other things out uh, this morning concerning uh, our thoughts uh, this week. But in Acts chapter 17... Uh, verses 24 through 28. And you'll see me from time to time go from side to side and read. And I like doing that. I like moving around. Uh, sometimes I've been told that uh, if people want to record me with a camera, I am, uh, I'm just terrible on that because I'll move from side to side. I just like moving. I, I, I can't help it. I feel comfortable doing that. So I'll move from side to side and I'll read from this side. I bet you probably thought I only could read from that side, but I can read from this side too. But Acts chapter 17, uh, verses 24 through 28. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he has made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. Those are some very powerful statements that are made about our God. There are six things that I want to point out from these verses that the apostle is pointing out to these folks as he's teaching them about God. The first thing there in verse 24, he points out that God is the creator. He is the maker of all of us. And in particular, man, as we talked about this morning, and that is man is the crown jewel of God's creation. And so the Bible teaches us how we ought to be, how we ought to live, because we are important to God. As we have even read in Jesus' statement there in Matthew 10, that we are more valuable than the animals. God loves us. God wants us to, uh, he wants to have fellowship with us. And so he, Paul points out, God is the creator and, now notice, Lord of his creation. That's another powerful statement there. And I tell you, we could spend the whole series uh, this week talking about that particular point. 
And one of the things that Paul is bringing to our attention, or the Holy Spirit through the Apostle, in this is that God created us, and God just did, uh, didn't create us and then just set us there and let us do whatever we wanted. No, that's not how God did with us. God created us, and, and Paul says, and He is Lord of His creation. He rules, He reigns. Yes, God is interacting with us. God is aware of what's going on. That's what Paul is doing. That's what Paul is conveying, that He is Lord of His creation. God is involved with us. That's the point. And as we grasp that point and learn that, it's going to help us transform our lives. The second thing there in verse 25, he is not confined to or by the creation. In other words, God is limitless. We serve an awesome creator. He is limitless. And that's what he's pointing at. He's not confined. to. So if you want to call yourself holding creation hostage to God, Paul is saying, no, he's not confined to that. He's above that. In other words, God surrounds His creation. It's not that His creation surrounds Him. And that's the point in verse 25. The third thing in verse, uh, uh, he points out, He does not need the creation because He is self-existing. He is self-sufficient. That's what those verses are pointing out. The fourth thing, the creation needs Him. We need God. That's the thought. God doesn't need the creation. The creation needs Him. The fifth thing in verse 26, He set appointed times, seasons, and boundaries. God has determined those things. In other words, as Genesis chapter 1 and uh, verse 14 uh, points out, look over there uh, quickly, and uh, some of you may even have that memorized, but in, first, uh, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, And God said, Let there be light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. That's what you're seeing, the set boundaries. And let them be signs and for seasons and for days and years. Uh, let me address uh, a present situation. And many of you probably are familiar with the phrase uh, global warming. Yes. Man has brought about global warming. That's the teaching that's going on uh, out there. And what they're trying to do is subvert the mind, take control, reach in your pocket, and take as much money as they can from it. Because that's their God, you see. And then when everything went haywire, as they were having this global warming summit over in Europe, it snowed. Well, we got to change that. We got to change it. And then not, uh, not only that, but they were saying that the glaciers were melting and found out they're expanding. So we got to change the thought process. Climate change. That's what they changed the, the, the format to. And when they did that, I said, wow, yes. Climate change is real. <laughs> not the way that they think it is. It's the way that God set it up. Back here in Genesis 1. I'm not afraid when they make those statements. I'm not afraid about that. I go back to, that's, yes, it is real the way God set it up. There is winter. There is spring. There is summer. There is fall. Yes, climate change is real. And so you're not going to take me captive saying that man is controlling all of this or man is causing destruction. To No, God set it up that way and that's the way it is. That's our creator. 
And so when Paul is pointing these things out here in Acts 17, verses 24 through 28, the point is that God determined them. And when God determines something, there is nothing you can do about it. Nothing. Why? Because God is self-sufficient. Because God is the creator. God is self-existing. His creation needs him. And then the sixth thing that Paul brings to the attention of the hearers there in verse 28, that God surrounds us all with himself. And we could not live or move or exist without him. That's the point that he brings home there in verse 28. When we capture that kind of mentality, then we begin to see the way that the world is made, how beautiful and how wonderful everything is. That our God created the world, the heaven. In fact, he even talks about and, and where God is self-sufficient and that the creation needs us and God created all those things. Look at all of the things that are there. Look at all the planets. And God surrounds it. It could not exist without Him. And that's only one galaxy. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to go to the Creation Museum there in Kentucky. Uh, one of the uh, events that they have there, and I really appreciate, is uh, the planetarium section. And they talk about all the galaxies and so forth there at, that, at the planetarium. Now, I've been to some very sophisticated planetariums. I've been to the one up in New York, I've been to the one in Chicago, and I've been into all of their planetariums, and they look fabulous the way that they are designed. And I go into the Creation Museum's planetarium, and it's not as sophisticated as what I had experienced in New York, what I had experienced in Chicago, and I even went to one over in, uh, in California. They're not, that Creation Museum's planetarium is not sophist as sophisticated as theirs, but it is better. It's better. You know what made it better? They mentioned the power of God. They mentioned that God is the one that created all of these galaxies. And they took you far, far away as, the, uh, as they could observe by the telescopes and so forth. And they showed how tremendous the creation is. And they mention God creating all of this. In all of those other sophisticated planetariums, God was not mentioned once. Not once. And it was sad. It was sad. And so the planetarium there in the Creation Museum, because they mentioned God, God did this, it made it the best of the planetariums that I've been in. It's not about the instruments. It's about God. And so Paul brings that to their attention. And our theme this week, as we are talking about those things, is the securing of our hearts. How do we do this? How do we secure our heart that no one takes it, uh, robs us of what God has provided? And how we do that, as we will talk about this morning, is we need to recognize the need for God. That's what Paul was bringing out there in Acts 17. The need for God. Now, how does that play an important part in securing our hearts? And we'll begin to look at those things as we observe the thoughts that are expressed throughout the scriptures. The first thing that uh, in showing and securing our hearts in this need for God is this. To explain our existence. Wait a minute. How does that secure our hearts? 
How would that secure our heart of God or the need for God to explain our existence? Think about what people are doing. How they're walking aimlessly through life. They are subject to all kinds of teachings here and there and everywhere. They are able to, as we were talking about, as I mentioned about the, the, uh, the global warming. You know, a lot of folks were sub, uh, su uh, subduced to this. Yeah, they were taking control of. And they listened to these guys knowing that their information was faulty and everything. And they did it for nefarious reasons. And yet individuals fall, uh, took uh, of it, as I would say, hook, line, and sinker. Someone asked me, was I a fisherman? Uh, but anyway, hook, line, and sinker. They fell for it. And they were taken control of. And they were being led by their noses of whatever those individuals said. You see, if they had learned their existence, that it is our creator that created us and has set the boundaries in regards to uh, the distinction between the seasons and so forth, they would not be taken captive by the false philosophies that exist in our day. And some of those philosophies, again, existed way back when, but God addressed them. We need to understand that God explains our existence and shows us or reveals to us that we are his crown jewel. That's what Psalms 8 verses 3 through 9 is doing. David is pondering who he is in connection to the Creator. As he, you can imagine, David out there as a sheep herder watching over the sheep at night, and uh, there is uh, no industrial uh, fumes in the air <laughs> blocking the sunlight. There are no towers and so forth. He's able to look up in the stars and see how numerous they are. And as he ponders that, how could this magnificent creation and you consider me? That's what he was doing. That's what he's pointing out. And these things were recorded for us so that we might see them. That our existence came from God. We did not evolve from animals. Someone said, it, you know how they talked about the computer garbage in, garbage out? It's the same with us. If you feed individuals garbage and they don't recognize who they are and where they're from, if they're fed that you are an animal, what happens? You act like one. But if you are fed that you have been created and God breathed into you intelligence, will, and affection, then you know that you are different. I, I, I like uh, getting in the water. I got myself into trouble when I was younger. And uh, I, I just love to swim. And I start thinking about as, you know, recently you have like Shark Week and so forth. <laughs> when have you ever seen uh, sharks get together and build a water bubble and say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to lift one another out of the water and we're going to see how humans do things. It's the other way around, isn't it? It is man that comes up with the, the thought of putting himself in a cage uh, and the air tanks and so forth and able to submerge himself in the water and be able to observe things that are going on. Now, I know some of you say, well, I'm not going to get in a cage with sharks and so forth. But that's what we do. That's man. God breathed into us intelligence. Uh, there was an old song. There was an old uh, show that used to come on, uh, Flipper. 
And at the time, I really liked the, the, the show. And the reason why I liked the show, because again, I loved the swim. I loved, uh, you know, with, with the dolphin. But I never really thought about the song. They call him Flipper. There is no one smarter than he. Wait a minute. Whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was in the song. And it had a nice little jingle to it because of that. They call him Flipper, Flipper, you know, faster than line, and so forth. And you, and you thought about, and then as I got older, and I thought about the song, and I said, no one's smarter than he? Yes. Man is smarter than dolphins, even though they seem to carry, uh, seem to be smart or whatever. I, it does seem that way. But they're not smarter than humans. You see what I'm saying? When we are fed things like that, it takes us away and therefore unsecure our hearts. And then whatever philosophy comes in takes over. And then we're led down a path away from God. The Bible tells us and explains our existence to lead us to God. So that we can be in the image and likeness that he gave us or made us. That's what it's all about. When we recognize that our hearts are going to be secured. Notice the passage that was uh, read to us. First John chapter uh, four, verse eight. The one who does not love does not know God for God is love. God shows us what love is all about. That's what John is bringing to the attention of the readers. You had individuals during that time were going around thinking that they were know-it-alls. That God was so far removed from his creation because he could not have any communication with it because he's so holy. And if you want to understand God, then you have to come to us. We will tell you. And John is writing and letting those brethren know, no, you don't. You learn from God. You know who he is. And if you know who he is, then what you're going to do is you're going to know what love is all about. And so he's encouraging them to learn from God, to know him, because God is love. He shows you what it is. And then dropping down to verse 16 uh, in that uh, chapter there, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. You see, when we are following the way that God teaches us when it comes to love, we are ascending to the image and likeness of Genesis 1 verses 26 and 27. God explains our existence. He reveals to us who we are and what we are all about. He has instilled in us, when we learn from him, a belief system that changes our lives. Paul's, uh, Paul wrote in uh, to the letter to Timothy in the second Timothy there. And he was expressing to Timothy in verses 20 through 21. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthware and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. It is the work that God determines as good. See what's going on? We're being brought back to where we need to be. God explains our existence. So we need him. 
We have to recognize that. And if we don't recognize that, then we will wander through life aimlessly. And then at the end, we will lose our souls. How do you secure your heart and determine this need for God? Again, that's the passage that I pointed out and we read. And that is to guide us. We need someone to guide us. Yeah. We are like sheep that have gone astray. That's the point. We need someone to lead us back. We grope around and we search and think that we know the way that we ought to go and how we ought to be apart from God? No, we don't. How often have things changed? Fads come in and they go. Yeah, they do. There was the era of the bell bottoms. Yeah, I lived during that era. Oh, that's the, yeah, that's the way people should be dressing. How often now that we look back and say, ooh, <laughs> what was I thinking? Yet yeah, that's the way we are in life. Things change. You know, butter is not good for you. But this man-made product is. <laughs> you know, that's how we do that. And now, no, butter is good for you. Not the man-made product, you see. And I mean, you're just going back and forth. Eggs are not good for you. Eggs are good for you. you know, that's what's going on. Um, and so we don't know which way to go. So we're tossed here and there. We need someone to guide us. God does that. God guides us. He gives us and shows us where we need to go. In Jeremiah chapter 10, a passage that I'm sure we are familiar with, uh, Jeremiah 10, verses 23 to 24, you know, he says, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor is it in a man who walks to direct his steps. Correct me, O Lord, but with justice. Be fair, not with your anger. Or you will bring me to nothing. You see, what is Jeremiah saying? Jeremiah is telling us. The way that we ought to go is not in us. We need someone to show us. Even though we have been created in the image and likeness of God, sin destroyed that. Sin destroyed it. Sin separated us from God. In fact, uh, I always look at that situation as uh, in, in Genesis 3 when God pronounces the judgment for the sin of man and the separation comes back that's in other words we became unplugged to life but God provided a way that we could be plugged back in and that was through Christ Jesus but apart from God the way that we ought to go is not in us it is not until we have the guidance of God that shows us what we need to do to make things right to uh, be reconciled to Him and follow His direction, we end up learning and knowing what love is. And we're not held captive by the philosophies of men, as Paul wrote the Colossian brethren there in Colossians chapter 2 and, and verse 8. And so, God guides us. I know uh, the psalmist says this in Psalms 73 verses 21 through 26 and uh, these psalms are just tremendous when you read through them notice when my heart was embittered and I was pierced within then I was senseless and ignorant I was like a beast before you notice that those words there heart embittered pierced senseless in other words I was out of my mind He says, I was like that beast. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. I held up my left, right. With your counsel, you will guide me. Do you see that? 
and afterwards receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The psalmist determined that the right way to go is by the guidance of God, listening to his counsel. In chapter 32 of Psalms, uh, verses 6 through 10, you see that again expressed this, this concept of needing God. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Do not be as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding. Uh, uh, some of you probably remember what mules, what mules are. Kind of foreign to a lot of folks. They were really like work, they were work horses, sort of combination of horse and a donkey. But notice what he said, don't be like that. Whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, they will not come near to you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, that is his counsel, loving kindness shall surround him. You want to have peace of mind? You want to have peace of heart? Surround yourself with the counsel of God and let him guide you. And he in turn will surround you with loving kindness. Isaiah, people put their trust in all kinds of things except for God. And so Isaiah deals with this comparison of the true living God with the false gods that Israel had put their trust in. And he says to them in verses 24, 22 to 24, let them bring forth and declare to us what is going to take place. All of the things that man would put his, uh, his trust in other than God, let them declare what will take place. We're blinded. Don't be blind. Follow the counsel of God. Let God declare to you and I what we ought to be, where we ought to go. How do we secure our hearts in this, or how does God, the need for God, secure our hearts? It prepares us to meet Him. That's what it does. He prepares us to meet Him. You see, our God is a holy God. He's a just God. He's going to punish because we're going to be held accountable. I want you to show, I want to see, show you the love of our God. The love of our God is expressed there in Isaiah chapter 59. Where here you have Israel, he's rebuking Israel for their sins. Their hands are defiled with blood. They've been practicing injustices. They have been sacrificing their children to Moloch. Equivalent to our modern day abortion. That's what they were doing back then. And they had persecuted the prophets. The prophets were coming and showing them how they ought to live and how to be right with God and how to enjoy life by following the commandments of God. They had forgotten the covenant that they had made with God. And so he's there to remind them. And so what he expresses there in verses 16 and 17, God says, I looked and I saw that there was no man and was astonished that there was no one to intercede. No one to intercede. To bring about justice. For someone to stand between the ones that could not defend themselves, couldn't find anyone. And God said, as Isaiah points out to us, 
Then his own arm brought salvation to him. And his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with a zeal as a mantle. God went to work, so to speak. And then in 62 of Isaiah, as he continues that thought and expression of God going to work, here you see him in this picture as a warrior that has gone out and has done fighting and he comes back and his clothes are bloody. From the fight for justice, standing up in between, uh, between those who could not defend themselves. And so Isaiah says, why is your apparel red? and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress. I have trodden the wine trough alone, and from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath, and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. I fought. I battled. I won, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. I looked, and there was no one to help, and I was astonished, and there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me, and my wrath upheld me. Our God went to battle, and he crushed the enemy. And you get this picture of God showing them who He is so that they would remember and see the love that He had for them and see that His counsel keeps them from being His enemy because He will crush them. So God's preparing us to meet Him. Not in battle, but in victory. But we have to submit ourselves to him. Paul says this in his writing to the Galatian brethren. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ... Have clothed yourselves with Christ. If you listen to what God says, if you see what He has done for you in Christ Jesus, and you submit to His will, obey His gospel, then you're going to be wrapping yourself up in Christ Jesus, and you're going to be led to victory. It's all about God. It's all about our need for Him. And when we recognize our need for Him, then our hearts will be secured because we will follow what He says. Because we have learned our existence. He guides us and He prepares us to meet Him. Salvation will be ours if we do His will. You see, outside of God, here's where you are. You are in the arena of death. You're in the arena of condemnation. You're in sin. You're on the path of destruction. That's what Isaiah was pointing out there in Isaiah 62. And that's what the Lord teaches throughout. But what God was doing is, how did He bring salvation? He brought it through His Son, Christ Jesus. Because the light of Jesus, when we turn to Him, 
Notice all the things that we have. All the spiritual blessings. We have forgiveness of sin. We have sonship. In other words, we are now children of God. We have an inheritance sealed, enrolled in heaven, a new creation. We have deliverance. The question is, how do we do that? How do we get into all of that? Well, we obey by being baptized into Christ. We have faith in Jesus. We are baptized, and as we are raised up out of the water, we walk faithfully in, in Christ, continued obedience. And that's what will happen. We'll have those things. We will be saved. If you will, pray with me. Our merciful God and Father, we ask that you would be with us. Help us to recognize our need for you so that you may tell us how we came about and who we are. That you may guide us through this life that will ever please you and be what you would have us to be. And that you'll prepare us, Lord, as we submit ourselves to your will obey your gospel, continue to walk according to what you have given us so that at the end of life, we will receive the promises that you have so richly blessed us with, and that is the hope of heaven so that we can live with you throughout eternity. That is your desire for us. We ask you, Lord, to help us to have that same desire to be with you. We pray these things to your son, Jesus. Amen. If you have not obeyed the gospel of Christ, I want to encourage you to take advantage of it now before it's everlasting too late. All things are ready. Our work this week is to reach souls and encourage them to consider the way of God so that when their life is over, that they will be with him throughout eternity. So as we work together, let us pray that God gives the increase to our efforts as we do watering, as we do planting and watering for those souls that are lost and that will continue to follow his will as well. Thank you very much for this opportunity. So if we can assist you in your obedience to Christ, we encourage you to come and make it known as we stand.